Josh Reynolds is the latest wide receiver coming into Baltimore for a visit. He's slated to visit the Ravens on Friday. And we talk about if he is the best option that the Ravens have right now still on the wide receiver market, even over a Michael Gallup. All that and more come up next year on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Allstriker of Ravens Wire, coming to you from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes a video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your shows. Five days a week of Ravens content, plus bonus content. Going to have some bonus content coming out over the weekend, bringing the Ravens news analysis, updates, and so much more. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus special when you follow the bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started i am kevin Allstrike. you can see my tag there i forgot to take it off i want to i want to be even here on the tags there we go rocco de sangro in the house of fox 45 the ryan ripkin show rocco free agency has been going on now for almost two weeks it feels like it just started yesterday honestly the ravens signed derrick henry and now they've been a little more active with some wide receivers coming in to visit the squad and feels like the ravens have a certain direction they want to go in at that position yeah, it feels that way, man. And you see the Ravens, they're, they've been kind of quiet. They're not making these splashy moves. The Derrick Henry one was loud. I talked about that the other day. It was, you talk about the noise. Are they going to make these loud moves? Are they going to be quiet and kind of fly on the, under the radar when it comes to NFL free agency and make these moves? Derrick Henry one was obviously a splash. It was one of the biggest moves of the offseason for any team. And then you go out and you add some pieces, quiet pieces, you bring back board, you get a veteran offensive lineman as well, and uh, you bring back some of your guys. So I think the Ravens are doing it their way. They're not worried about what any other team is doing in the AFC North, the AFC, or the NFL. Eric DaCosta has a plan, and he's trying to put it into place week in and week out to make this team the best roster possible for that first game in 2024. Right, now we're seeing them with the wide receiver position they brought back nelson aguilar before free agency started but odell beckham pens what looked like a goodbye to baltimore hasn't signed anywhere else yet but that bridge apparently appears to just not be one where those two can reunite anymore so the ravens are looking at other options on the free agent market they already have four on the roster but they brought in michael gallup for a visit on thursday but the new report coming out from Adam Schefter yesterday was that Josh Reynolds, former Lions wide receiver drafted by the Rams back in 2017, he's going to be coming in for a visit today on Friday. And Reynolds is somebody that maybe people trust more over Michael Gallup. Gallup had the injury in 2021 that seemed to sap him a little bit. But I think a lot of people like what Reynolds brings to the table. Not, not a household name or anything like that in terms of the star name potential Odell gave you in Baltimore but a really solid player for the Lions last season, averaged just under a yard, less per reception than Odell did have. How would you like a potential Josh Reynolds addition to the Ravens, and what do you think he'd bring? I wouldn't mind it at all, man. I think Josh Reynolds is a guy that flies under the radar, and he would be a perfect fit for the Ravens. He was uh, Jared Goff's third option last year behind Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta, and those are – Two guys that I'm, I'm okay with him being behind. I know Jamison Williams didn't play the full season, but he'll probably be that third or second option this year for Goff. But looking at a guy like Reynolds and what he brings to the table, he's proven to be able to make plays, uh, be considered enough of a deep threat to get it done on the offensive side of the ball um, for his quarterbacks. And his, his QBs trust him. In L.A., he was trusted – in Detroit, he's trusted. And if he comes to Baltimore, I feel like he'll be trusted as well. And, you know, everybody made such a big deal about the Nelson Aguilar signing last year. And it was funny. It was it was like watching social media. Everyone like, you think Nelson Aguilar in the past and you think drop passes. And you saw Josh Reynolds 
drop a few passes, drop some big passes in the uh, NFC championship game. And that's going to stick out because you can call it like a recency bias or that's the last game the Lions played this season. But I think this is a really good, talented veteran wide receiver. No, he he's not going to bring the star power to Baltimore, but I think the Ravens would be okay with that, bringing in a guy that, that Lamar Jackson can trust and add another target and another deep threat for him this season. Yeah, Reynolds averaged just over 15 yards per catch last year. Beckham again, just over 16 for him. But to me, I also think that with a guy like Josh Reynolds, also spent some time over with Tennessee, he's a veteran who's been places. He's had to play in some big games. And look, he's faced some adversity in those big games too. You mentioned in that NFC Championship game. But for the Ravens and what they have right now, what they have available to them, with Lamar Jackson on his big deal now, it just changes the way that Eric Acosta has to do and go about things. It just does with a different way the Texans are doing things right now, how the Bears are doing things right now. Those are rookie quarterback contract moves. The Ravens aren't in that era anymore. So you can't go out there and sign a Calvin Ridley to that deal Tennessee gave. Again, Will Levis, rookie contract. Those are the moves you make. But for <laughs> Josh Reynolds, he's not going to cost you that. Gallup, he's not going to cost you that. Now, would you prefer a Tyler Boyd or if Odell, if there was any world that would happen, would you prefer him back, Michael Thomas? Or do you think that Reynolds is perfectly fine in your opinion and he would be your top choice out of the receivers who are currently left veteran-wise on the market? Tyler Boyd would be ideal, especially since the AFC North, you know, the rivals are just taken away from the Ravens. So why not take one of their own or, you know, one, one of the former uh, players? But looking at a guy like Reynolds, Ben, I would not mind that signing at all. And, you know, we talked about Gallup kind of before this even started, this stream, and he's had the injury history he was coming off that ACL. Is Michael Gallup going to be the Michael Gallup of old? Yes, he has the name, but is he going to bring to the table what he did be before the injury? Whereas Josh Reynolds, I, I kind of trust him more on that injury front. It's tough to come off of an ACL injury. Odell Beckham, he suffered two of them. So he still did all right last season. He helped the Ravens out tremendously uh, in their run to the playoffs. So Josh Reynolds, I, I would like. I, I think that would be the Ravens' best option. If, if they can, though, go out and get a Tyler Boyd, by all means, do it. But like we talk about all the time, man, for the right price, because there there are two big things you have to worry about. While wide receiver is a big point of emphasis in the off season, as it should be, because we're we're unsure of what the Ravens are going to do with Rashad Bateman picking up that fifth year option or not picking up that fifth year option. It's for me right now. It, it's offensive line number one. And then it is – make sure I get my finger in the frame. And then <laughs> cornerback number two. So those are the two right now, the top two. And then you can put wide receiver at number three for me. Ravens, yeah, they, they might differ in opinion from me, but th those are <laughs> the top two and three priorities right now for me for the Ravens. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with you on offensive line. I think that is by <laughs> far and away the number one. But in terms of Reynolds, you mentioned kind of Gallup's injury history. Reynolds – Ended up playing first four years in the league, played in all 16 games each season. Then 2021, only played in 12 games. 2022, only played in 14, but then played in all 17 last season. So he's somebody that I think can be a durable option for you and a solid option. But these are the types of moves where I think, Rocco, why a Reynolds or a Gallup might not excite some people is because, well, that's not a Stephon Diggs. That's not, you know, that's not getting Lamar his A.J. Brown or his DeAndre Hopkins or going out there and, and getting him that pure number one player like so many have, like the Bills did do for Josh Allen getting Stephon Diggs. Is that the right move for you where even, you know, we talked about Cortland Sutton as a potential target, even though Denver said they're not trading him, but a guy who could compliment maybe be a one beat as a Flowers or be in that conversation. Are you okay with them? getting maybe a third wide out or a fourth wide out and trusting Rashad Bateman essentially to take over that number two role. Because if they do sign Reynolds or if they do sign Gallup, to me, that's putting a lot of trust in Rashad Bateman to essentially take over that number two spot and be comfortable in that role because they're not bringing in somebody to compete with him or take away his snaps. They're bringing somebody in to compliment him. I'm kind of indifferent on Rashad Bateman right now because – the guy has so much potential to be great. And you saw the film that Jonas Schaefer 
put out and it kind of went viral within the flock, he was beating his guys. Like he, he was beating defensive backs on multiple occasions, but sometimes Rashad Bateman wasn't Lamar's first look or even his second look. He was looking elsewhere. And I'm not saying, oh yeah, that's on Lamar, but you know, that that's what you're going out and doing. He, he puts in the work. He's had the injury history in the past, but if you're going to pick up the fifth year option, you're going to have to trust him. You, you are going to have to trust this guy to be your number two, your solid number two, because if you're not, and if you continue, it, it, it turns into a pride thing, honestly, for receivers, for Rashad Bateman. It's like, okay, you're bringing in this guy, this guy, and this guy. How much do you actually trust me? And it's then you ask yourself the question, like, what have you done for me lately? So I, I know this fan base is frustrated, and they have every right to be with how Rashad Bateman's kind of panned out. But I think this is a guy that has so much potential to be maybe not a top wide receiver on the Ravens. That's going to go to Zay Flowers every day, but a guy that can compliment him. But the Ravens, like they did with, okay, the question last year was, what are they going to do with the pass rush? Odafe Owe, David Ajabo, these are young guys. These are young guys with not too much experience in the National Football League. They went out and added two more pieces. So would it surprise me if the Ravens brought in two of these guys? I'm not saying Michael Gallup and Josh Reynolds, but one, one, and then maybe someone else. Um, no, it wouldn't at all, Kevin. And I don't think it would surprise you either, man. No, it wouldn't. I think Baltimore is at least going to add two wide receivers. I think what I envision them doing is adding one veteran and one through the draft, but we can see maybe a couple veteran camp bodies like they did with Laquan Treadwell last year. He makes the practice squad and then gets called up a couple times to play. So it wouldn't shock me at all. And I think for Reynolds, someone who can work over the middle of the field very well, also was a first down magnet, has picked up a lot of first downs over the course of his career. So right spot and at the right time for Josh Reynolds. And I think that, again, if you're asking, is it is would you rather have a Josh Reynolds or a Michael Gallup? I think for me personally, I'm on the Josh Reynolds train. I, it's safe to say you're on that train too, Rocco. Yeah, absolutely. I think Josh Reynolds is, you know, if, if they go Gallup, fine. Doesn't bother me. I don't know if it'll bother this fan base either. But if I had to pick between the two, I'm going to go Josh Reynolds every day of the week. That's just yeah. how I feel about Josh Reynolds and how reliable he can be for this football team. It's not a knock on Gallup. Sure. Yeah. I think he slots in as a number three wide receiver. And then your top four, it's Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman, Josh Reynolds, Nelson Aguilar. And then you bring in probably a day two wide receiver, potentially. Maybe yeah. you draft him in the first round. I don't know. But yeah. No, no, no. I don't. Like, like, look, look at who's on the roster right now, Kev, who's on the depth chart. And then you see Tylen Wallace is not going to be expected to be a receiver per se for this team. I mean, he's going to, he's going to play at that position, but he's going to be the return specialist, much like Devin Duvernay was before he went to Jacksonville. So they're going to rely on him. So right now, who do you have on the depth chart? You have Nelson Aguilar, you have Zay Flowers, you have Rashad Bateman, and right now you have Tyler Wallace. Am I missing anyone off the top of my head? No, that's it. That's four receivers. So so technically, if you're looking at it, you, you really only have three receivers on the depth chart right now and a return specialist in Tyler Wallace. And not only that, the only wide receiver – under contract after this season is up, or after I guess next season is up, is Zay Flowers. So maybe they pick up Bateman's fifth year option. Maybe they don't, but maybe Reynolds could be a two year guy. They sign him to do a two year deal and it, it goes well. They have him on the roster. So a lot of options for Baltimore in that receiving room. Coming up though, in the second part of the show, we'll talk about another signing the Ravens made. And if it's an underrated one, the Ravens getting an offensive lineman. So be sure to stay tuned. A lot to get to here on Lockdown Ravens. First, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Therapy has so many different benefits from learning positive coping skills, from how to set boundaries as well. It can even empower you to become the best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's for everyone. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is follow the question to get matched with licensed therapists and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today. Take 10% off your of first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. We're back our second segment of Locked On Ravens with Rocco DeSangro. I am 
Kevin Ostrick. Rock, we talked a lot about the offensive side of the ball, the wide receiver position. Let's stay on that side of the ball, but move to a different position. You said for the Ravens offensive line, their number one need right now. And the Ravens go out there, and yesterday they signed an offensive lineman. Now, I don't think a lot of people were notified of the signing when it actually happened. I think a lot of people I saw on Twitter were like, well, my phone didn't tell me about this. Why? I didn't even hear about this signing. When did it happen? But yes, yesterday the Ravens go out there. They signed Josh Jones, a veteran offensive tackle. Now he's still young. He's 26 years old, was drafted mm-hmm. by the Arizona Cardinals in the third round a couple of years ago. Has struggled at times, but has played a lot of different positions. So for him, the versatility is a big aspect of it. And a lot of people are maybe already dubbing him. I've seen the next John Simpson, someone who, again, struggled during his time early in his career with Vegas, started a lot of games, but couldn't really get it going, comes to Baltimore and kind of finds a home. A lot of people have similar hope with Josh Jones. I don't expect Josh Jones to start Rocco, but in terms of versatile depth, might take some pressure off of Patrick McCarry and someone who could slot in if there is an injury or maybe some uncertainty in one of those positions with three starters now out and them looking for answers. You never know though, man, because I don't think a lot of people expected John Simpson to start before last season training camp. You get to that uh, starting left guard. Just it was that battle was one of the most talked about battles in training camp. It was between John Simpson and Salah Muvailaulu. Pretty sure I said that name right. Yeah, hey man, I call him Sal. I'll give you, I, I'll, <laughs> man, I give you credit for it. Listen, man, it's Sala. Yeah, that's but right. As far as that goes, that competition, it was like the the football player term, like the it iron sharpens iron, and I think it, it made Sala better as well. And you saw him get some time last season here and there, but John Simpson, it was for him. He's trying to feed his family. He's trying to make you know not make a name for himself because he played with the Raiders, but bring himself back to where he wanted to be. And that's a starting offensive lineman. And if you're talking about a guy that's on a a contract year, John Simpson definitely played like it and well-deserved. I mean, going to the jets, signing with them and doing that, he played himself into that contract over there. So I, I think that you never know with a guy like this, with Josh Jones, what he's going to turn into. I I feel like the the floor would be a, okay, you're, you're versatile. You could be the Patrick McCary. You could be a guy where if one of our starters goes down, you could step up and fill that role. Like Patrick McCary has done so well at guard at tackle. He's a Swiss army knife of the Ravens O-line. And I think many people have called him that before the ceiling for him. Maybe he can start this season. And, you know, the flock might be like, oh, yeah, no. Like, we need to go out and draft someone. This guy's only on a one-year contract. Fair. But if they feel like that is necessary, if this guy just balls out in training camp and beats out, okay, maybe um, a Daniel Falele, who is in his third season now or entering his third season now, or in Andrew Voorhees, who was supposed to be a rookie last year, I mean – still technically to my terms is, but is coming off that injury. Or if you're looking at other guys, like, okay, look at Ben Cleveland. If Ben Cleveland's, but I, but I think Ben Cleveland is going to secure a starting spot in camp, especially with the way he played towards the tail end of last season. But a guy like this, it could help. It's a signing that Eric DaCosta is not going to make. If he doesn't feel like this guy could help out the team in some way, shape, or form. But the biggest thing for the Ravens was adding O-line depth. It's a top priority. Might not be a splash like to the to the magnitude of a Derrick Henry in, in the running back position. Obviously not. But I think it really helps the Ravens out depth-wise when it comes to the position. And now they can focus on the draft. They can focus on bringing in more guys in free agency. And I guess we see where it goes from there. Yeah, to your point about his versatility, Jonah Schaefer put out some PFF staffs, stats about uh, where he's played in his career. So at left tackle, that's where he's played the most, 761 career snaps over there. Left guard, 63. Right guard, 612. And right tackle, 256. So he's played everywhere along the line, but in the middle, it's center. And I think the, <laughs> they, don't, they don't need a center. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah the one position you feel comfortable about long term for the Ravens is center. <laughs> I mean, you have Ronnie Stanley at left tackle, but look, there's an opening at left guard, there's an opening at right guard, and there's an opening at right tackle. Jones can be 
in the competition for those three positions. And again, even if it doesn't end in a starting role for him, I think that there's just not a lot of pressure on him where as in Arizona, he was kind of thrust into a role there, Houston trades for him. And I know he struggled at times over there too, but they're not going to ask him to do a whole bunch off the bat. I don't think. And I expect them to draft an offensive lineman very high, at least whether I think round two at the maximum is where they draft an (laughs) offensive lineman. So I think that you're going to have an option for him to kick inside, but we saw the guard market, Rocco. We saw how lucrative it was this offseason. I mean, you have guys like Damian Lewis get four years, 53 from Carolina. Robert Hunt got 500 from Carolina. I mean, that the guard market was a lot more lucrative, and obviously the tackle position we saw Tyron Smith go to the Jets on a one-year deal worth up to $20 million. This is the Ravens getting somebody who they can throw into a competition, and again, on Lamar's big deal – they can't afford to give Robert Hunt five for a hundred. They can't afford to give Damian Lewis. So I'm not saying Jones is up to that caliber, but they have other options they feel comfortable enough with. And I would probably bet Rocco, this is their veteran signing and they're probably going to draft a couple guys in the draft and then let it all play out from there. But I do think that this is an underrated signing. I'm not, I'm not again, crowning him their best offensive lineman or anything like that, but I do think it has potential to be a lot better when we're talking at the end of the year as opposed to some people who saw him struggle in Houston and say, well, this guy's just washed up now. No, absolutely. He's, he's still young. He's still got a lot of football left to play. And I think if anything, the young guys that you're seeing on the offensive line right now in that room, they're going to be hungrier. When, when you bring in a veteran to any team and throw them in the mix, you know, you're, you're gunning for a starting position. So the young guys who are going to be competing with them, you're going to get a lot more out of them. Not that, not that you wouldn't have before, but, this is going to make everyone better, especially a guy that can play guard and tackle. You talked about the snaps. You talked about what, what Jonas tweeted out. It's like, I think it, it really is an underrated signing, Kev. I don't mean to echo what you're saying, but but I am. It's, it's honestly, I think it's going to be a signing. The hope is that Ravens fans look back on this and they say, all right, Eric DaCosta strikes again in EDC we trust as always. That's true. And again, this is a this is a long drawn out process for the Ravens, where again, they don't make five flashy signings a day. They don't. That's not how they operate. They make some of these, I guess you could call them reclamation projects. I think that's a bit unfair to some, but I still think that, look, Josh Jones was not regarded as one of these top offensive line free agents, but the Ravens are bringing him in to compete, to hopefully get better and give them another versatile option. Now you have two guys They can play a total of nine positions. Obviously, McCary can play all five, and Jones can play everywhere but center. I think that takes pressure off of McCary. It takes pressure off the entire offensive line. And you have two veterans who have been there and done that. Obviously, McCary has a bit more experience than Jones in a lot of different aspects. But I still think both those guys can play off of each other. And maybe you have Jones slot in as your swing tackle, and then McCary can focus more on the interior. Although McCary was a good tackle for him when he played last year. So I'm not counting him out of that either. Coming up though, we'll talk a bit more about the Ravens free agent strategy. If they're getting more aggressive in some general Ravens conversation as well, stay tuned. We've still got plenty to talk about here on Locked on Ravens. First, this show is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. I view Conway at all this year. I did have Kentucky and BYU go into the Sweet 16. I think I had Kentucky in my Elite Eight, so... Not a great start, but hey, my champ is still in, so I will take that for now. So visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown. I bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. We are back here on Purple Friday. It is Locked on Ravens, our final segment. Kevin Allstriker is still here with Rocco DeSang. We really appreciate everybody for tuning in today. And again, making Locked on Ravens your first listen. Be sure to subscribe, video form, and audio form. It's the same show, so if you want to listen one day, watch another day, you're not missing out on any content. We're also going to have some bonus episodes coming out this weekend. There's a lot of Ravens content. We can't fit it all into the five weekdays sometime. So then we extend it to the weekend here on Locked on Ravens. We'll be doing that, so... Look out for some bonus episodes there. Rocco, as is is we kind of talked about at the end of that second segment, the Ravens don't go out there and just spend $100 million in the first week of free agency. They made their big splash in Derrick Henry. 
Then they kind of laid low for a little bit, but we knew they were never done. We knew they were still going to make moves. I think for a lot of people, they see how the Ravens played last season. They see that this is their window right here. Lamar Jackson being 27 years old now, it's still crazy to think about. It feels like yesterday he was drafted, but they understand, fans understand that this is their time. So of course they want to go out there and get on the flashy signings and have Eric DeCasso do this and that. But how much do you trust in what the Ravens are doing, what they've exhibited based off of even what we ju- even what we saw last offseason from Nacosta and how week three of literally the season, in the season, the Ravens go and get Kyle Van Noy, who gets nine sacks. I really, truly trust what Eric DeCosta is doing. And I, you, you look at what he did last season. You look at how he's drafted over the years. You know, people are going to have their opinions about it, but last season was just a master class he put on with – Signing guys from Jadavian Clowney to Kyle Van Noy off his couch um, to bringing in Odell Beckham Jr. and basically extending that olive branch, whatever you want to call it, to Lamar Jackson and saying, hey, man, we got you someone. We got you a big name receiver. Yes, he's coming off of an injury, but someone that you can throw to, someone that you can connect with, someone that you know is going to make this team better and is going to be a locker room guy as well. And they did that. So I know it's it's tough to sit around and when you're when you're cheering for your favorite team and playing the waiting game, it sucks. You're like basically it's that meme where you're um, poking the ground or poking whatever with a stick and saying, like, do something. Come on, do something. It's like that's how I feel like th- this fan base can be sometimes. And it, it's understandable because it's you get impatient, you get impatient waiting. But they, they really do have a plan in place. And. I know they did lose a lot. You lose the Patrick Queens of the world. You lose the um, Ronald Darby's of the world. But here's what you do have. You have three cornerstones on your defense in Kyle Hamilton, Roquan Smith, Justin Matabike. On the offensive side of the ball, you probably have the best one-two punch or one of the best one-two punches at running back and quarterback in the National Football League and Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry, um, how are defenses going to stop that? And you might say, oh, yeah, they're going to stop it because they're going to be able to blow through the offensive line. Listen, be patient. When, when the Ravens draft, when free agency is over, then we can have our opinions about what they're doing. Because until they kick off that first game of the season – we, we are not truly going to know what this roster is going to look like. And I know it's tough. It's going to be a long off season sitting and waiting and watching, but Eric DaCosta has proven that he is one of the best general managers in the national football league. And he is doing a phenomenal job at bringing in the right pieces for this team to contend and win. He doesn't call the plays. I understand that, but the talent he's brought here to Baltimore has been top-notch, next level, and he's going to continue to try to do that through the draft and through free agency. Yeah, every team is different for the Ravens historically. That type of strategy has worked. It's different every offseason, right? I think a couple years ago when they signed Marcus Williams, signed Morgan Moses, signed Zedarius Smith, although, again, didn't work out the second time around. That was one way to do it. But then this way where you know you sign one guy and Derrick Henry and start to bring back some of your own free agents, including – Arthur Millette Rocco, who you, you kind of mentioned the Ronald Darby loss. Now that, that whole corner situation is going with Millette. They bring him back on a two-year deal, so not a one-year deal. So good for Millette for getting that long-term security in terms of that. But then you also have the question of, of corner where Brandon Stevens is a free agent after next year. Mm-hmm. You have Marlon Humphrey, whose contract might be a restructure or just an outright cut candidate contract as early as next season. And I'm not saying Millette's a long-term piece, but what does Millette bring to this team, especially because the Ravens did lose Ronald Darby, a guy who a lot of people in Baltimore wanted the Ravens to retain? Yeah, it's what Millette brings to the team is that veteran presence. I mean, he's 30. He's played in the AFC North, not only with the Steelers, but this past season with the Ravens. And then to bring him back on on a two-year deal, we talked about it a few weeks ago. It was who would you rather have or who would you rather you know bring back? Because you had the three cornerbacks that are all free agents in Rock Yassin, you have Millette, you have Darby. Darby was my number one choice. And 
I don't think that really surprises many people because of the way he played last season. He was fantastic for the Ravens. Millette was two. And then I had it. It pains me to do this because Rocky seen's a temple guy and, and you know, near and dear to my heart because I'm also a temple graduate, but he was three on that list. And this fan base was not happy the way he played. Um, they were frustrated with him. You, you could see it. You could feel it. But bringing back Millette, it's okay. What he brings to the table now, the veteran presence, and he's a th- solid third option at cornerback for the Ravens. And that's okay. In bringing him back, now you have three very solid cornerbacks in Marlin and Brandon Stevens and him rather than losing him somewhere in free agency and then having to worry about, okay, much like the offensive line, losing Morgan Moses via trade, losing John Simpson uh, via signing and Kevin Zeitler, the same thing, trying to go out and get another piece. So I think that's a big signing. Honestly, I think that's another signing that's going to fly under the radar. Even though they re-signed him, bringing him back, it adds depth at the cornerback position, and that's something the Ravens need. It's, you know, for me, off off-season priority number two is cornerback. So getting him, I think they're still going to draft a cornerback, much like I know they're going to draft an offensive lineman. So those two positions, I think we're going to see a lot of guys the Ravens end up taking in the draft and uh, sk- skill positions as well. But those two will continue to be a top priority until they kind of fill those holes that they need. Yeah, I think the thing with Millette is you get a really solid slot corner, but that's the thing where with Darby, you're losing your outside guy because he stepped up, Darby did, for Humphrey when he was out for a couple times last season. Now, I'm not saying Millette is a bad player because he's not. I mean, he played really well for the Ravens last season. Hopefully, he he continues that. But you look to maybe a Stephon Gilmore or a Trey White or one of those outside guys, Xavier Howard, who, again, they're veterans, have dealt with some injuries, especially Trey White. But Ronald Darby was coming off a torn ACL last year, and he turned into a very reliable, very strong corner for them. Yeah. And you can argue that all three of the players I just listed – have had better careers than Ronald Darby so far. So obviously it's it's circumstantial. Players age differently. They play differently off of injuries, and the injury risks are different for everybody. But I think there are still quality veterans out there. And then I agree, offensive line 100% going to be drafted. Corner also I think is going to be drafted. Baltimore also brought back Chris Board, a familiar face, more of a special teams linebacker, but can be a veteran in there with Patrick Queen not a part of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But I want to ask you this question, Rocco, and then kind of kind of go in full circle with a wide receiver question. We started it off with Josh Reynolds, Michael Gallup, those guys. But Odell obviously didn't live up to the contract in terms of the money. $15 million up to 18. Now we can argue the leadership was there. The veteran presence that he brought was there. But in terms of his actual stats, I think people weren't necessarily impressed if you just look at the pure box score of what he did. Yeah. But – I think to me, it worked where Odell accepted his role. He was a mentor to a lot of guys. Yep. And again, he pens that farewell letter to the Ravens. I'm, I'm really curious as just why they're not giving it around too. I mean, do the Ravens maybe feel like he just doesn't have enough left in the tank for them? Were they concerned about how they had to kind of manage him throughout the preseason and kind of come up with a plan? Why do you think it didn't work out? Because I would assume Odell's not getting $15 million this offseason. So I feel like on a cheaper deal, it might have worked. But it feels like both parties have already moved on. You would think. Odell Beckham Jr. is a guy that is going to try to maximize his value at any point in his career. I get it. It's you're, You have the name. He is a for, – for the NFL – He's a household name, maybe, you know, not not because of the talent this year, but Odell Beckham Jr. You say the name Odell Beckham Jr., it's like, say, 90 plus percent of the, it's a random number, but the casual <laughs> football fan knows who that is. And all right, they've seen the catch. They've seen what he did in New York, but he's won a Super Bowl. He's been a number one on multiple teams he's played on, not with the Ravens. And yeah, I get he didn't live up to the, uh, 15 million or guaranteed 18 million total. Um, but you know what, man, he did. He was a mentor to a lot of these guys. And I, I think Odell Beckham Jr. might wait as long as he possibly can to sign because as he gets up there in age, he might not want to deal with all of the, 
okay, the voluntary OTAs and the, you know, the training camp and all that stuff that goes with it. Whereas like, it was funny hearing Kyle Van Noy say that last year. He's like, what training camp or something like <laughs> something along those lines in his press conference. I don't know. Maybe that's how Odell, Be Odell Beckham Jr. feels. He's a veteran. He's been there, done that. So I don't know, man. The value, I don't think for the Ravens, they're not, they're not going to sign him to another 15 to $18 million contract. They just don't have the money to spend that on a wide receiver, um, especially wide receiver that that is, you know, he's not getting any younger. And I get, it is what it is with him. But if they could get him back on a cheaper deal and if he would play ball, like I don't know how those conversations would even go. I think it would be great to have him back in ball. He, you know, he penned that farewell letter because he did get released, but I don't, I don't want to rule out Odell Beckham Jr. coming back. If, if, if only if he would want to come back and kind of take a hometown discount. But um, right now, like that part of me wants to say like, it, it's not over, but it, it probably is. Honestly, the writing was kind of on the wall with that. Yeah. And you look at Gallup being 28 years old, Reynolds is 29, Odell is 31. So we all, we know the injury history with Odell Gallup with, you know, he has had that serious injury to Reynolds, not so much. So I don't know. I just feel like if Baltimore is going the Reynolds or Gallup route kind of in that tier, I think Odell in this point in his career, he falls within that. I mean, with the Boyds and the Thomases and all those players, but it just feels like they both moved on and kind of understood where Odell was never, you know, seeing that 50 million bonus. I mean, that, the, the reason yeah. that was there was essentially to take off the void years or at least some of that money and then just say, okay, we're releasing you at this date. He was a free agent after this year regardless. So to me, I just don't know why both parties moved on so quickly, but I don't know. Big, biggest plot twist of the offseason if Odell has that whole letter and then says, psych, I'm, I'm coming back. You it can't does. Get <laughs> well, 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 I'll have you on it first. I'll say, you know, you, you didn't, Rocco didn't rule it out. So Rock, Rocco knows everything when it comes to Rock, Rocco's the insider when it, uh, no when it comes to, no when it comes to Odell. Rocco, I appreciate you, man. Thanks so much for hopping on again with me talking Ravens. Where, where can people find you and, and what's going on with you as we get, we're almost a month in the draft now, which is kind of crazy to think. Yeah, about. it's crazy, man. You, I mean, you really hit the nail on the head right there. Uh, you can find me on X at Rocco DeSangro on Instagram at rdesangro. Post a lot of content there. You can find me on the Ryan Ripken Show with Kevin, uh, Fox 45, Sports Unlimited. Um, tune in, you know, Sunday through Saturday, seven days a week. We'll be doing that. Myself and Morgan Adsit, um, trying to provide great content there. And, you know, just – Email me, reach out. If you want to have a conversation, I'm free and open to conversations. If you think, like I said before, if you think my opinions are dumb, I'm fine with that. I have thick skin. If you agree with them, let me know. That's great too. It's always fun having a conversation. I see how passionate this fan base is. And I, I really, truly love it, man, because there, there is nothing like Ravens flock and what they bring to the table on social media, out in person. Uh, it's really, truly awesome to see. So um, opening day for the O's is like, a week away now, so I'll, I'll be all over that and then getting ready for the draft, Kev. Yeah, crazy, crazy time in Baltimore sports, but the city's buzzing always. And the Orioles now, you know, used to be Ravens season ends. The Orioles kind of lose 100 games, and then you're back to Ravens. Now both teams are good, and Baltimore's needed that for a while. So I'm, I'm glad it's worked out that way. All the links to Rocco's work, of course, in the description below. Be sure to check him out. Follow him on social media, the whole nine yards there. Thank you for tuning in to Locked on Ravens today. That's all I have for you. Be sure to subscribe, follow along, video form, audio form, four or five days a week, plus more of Ravens content. We'll be right back here, I think, tomorrow. I think we'll do a bonus episode tomorrow here on Locked on Ravens. Again, these headlines coming fast and furious. And, of course, if the Ravens do sign a Josh Reynolds or a Michael Gallup tomorrow, we'll be back live tomorrow or maybe if they do it today we'll be back later today talking ravens on a live stream so be sure to stay tuned for everything we have coming up here i'll see you right back here soon on lockdown ravens